Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 286 of Humanity Rising. Later on today, uh, at uh, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, in about uh, three and a half hours, uh, we're going to have an open house to which uh, all of you are invited. Uh, hopefully, all of you received some notification uh, in your email. Uh, we've recently launched our Masters in Regenerative Action uh, with Kate Rayworth, who did a splendid uh, initial course on the fundamentals of donut economics. The purpose of the Masters in Regenerative Action is to create a cadre, a global cadre of regeneration first responders at a moment when uh, climate change and biodiversity loss are spinning out of control uh, and scientists are increasingly concerned and in fact predicting that if we don't change our course dramatically, uh, we will have a major extinction event uh, within the next several years. Uh, so we're not talking about something that's gonna happen in the 2100s. Uh, we're talking about something that could happen by 2023, 24, 25, certainly by 2026. So the most urgent necessity and challenge on planet Earth right now is for all of us to do whatever we can uh, to regenerate the larger ecosystem and regenerate uh, human communities. So we wanna invite all of you uh, to join our open house to find out how you can become a regeneration uh, first responder. Uh, we're developing incubator, accelerator, investment fund, internships. We have courses. We're linked to bioregions around the world. We're linked to cities around the world. Uh, and this is a unique opportunity uh, to come together uh, and create a global uh, network of first responders as we seek to regenerate uh, our planetary ecology. So that is an invitation to all of you and we'll put the link uh, up in the chat box uh, momentarily. Uh, in fact, several times in the course of our time together today. Uh, let us begin as we always do by just taking a moment, gathering yourself in your body, closing your eyes and placing your attention on your heart for the next about 90 seconds. Attune yourself to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and deep thanksgiving that you're alive. We're all alive at this most extraordinary and fragile moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. 
And now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude and love for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, we want to take our attention and travel to Scotland, to the great Caledonian forest. And we are going to spend the session today uh, looking at the Caledonian forest and hearing from a man, Alan Weatherstone, uh, who lives in Fintorn, the Fintorn community, uh, who's been working to save and grow and nurture the Caledonian forest uh, for over 30 years. Uh, he uh, set up the uh, NGO, uh, Living Trees, uh, that became a major catalyst in recognizing that the Caledonian forest was a treasure of Scotland and, in fact, the treasure for the world, and has been laboring with many other individuals and organizations uh, both to save uh, the Caledonian forest uh, and to nurture it into the beautiful uh, treasure that it is today. Uh, so I want to welcome you, Alan. Uh, to Humanity Rising. Uh, and Alan will give us a presentation, a, a slideshow uh, to show what he and others have been doing uh, in that region of Scotland. Uh, and then we'll have a dialogue with him uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, that will be our program for today. Alan, welcome. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thanks to you for the invitation to be part of Humanity Rising and hi to everybody out there who's uh, watching this webinar. Um, I think my topic is directly relevant to um, that brief introduction you gave, um, Jim, about uh, the session starting at 11.30 uh, Pacific time about regeneration because my work has been focused very much on the regeneration and restoration of this forest which uh, used to cover most of the highlands of Scotland. So I'll just dive straight into the presentation by um, turning on my screen share and selecting the relevant one. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and we'll get going. Okay, so the Caledonian forest um, originally covered most of the highlands of Scotland. And this is a scene from one of the areas I've been involved with helping it to recover because anybody who's been to Scotland will know that the country is famous these days for its treeless landscapes in the highlands, wide open green spaces with views everywhere. So the Caledonian forest is actually the westernmost extent of the boreal forest in Europe. The boreal forest is the conifer dominated woodland that occurs all around the northern latitudes of the planet. Alaska, Canada, the US, Scandinavia, Siberia, Russia, and so forth. And it's characterized by Scots pine, the backbone of the forest ecosystem. It's the longest lived tree. It's the largest thing in the forest. It's what everything else depends upon. But there's a range of other trees in it as well, um, birch, rowan, and aspen, um, to name a few, and a lot of unique and iconic wildlife, capricale, pine martens, red squirrels, and in the past, beavers, lynx, and wolves. So um, it used to cover about one and a half million hectares at its maximum extent about 4,000 years ago. And this is photograph here shows a, a little bit of what it's like inside today. But there's only about 2% of that left now. And that 2% looks very much like this photograph. Nice, beautiful old trees, um, but no young ones in sight. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. And the name uh, comes from Roman times. The Romans called Scotland Caledonia, which means wooded heights. And that straight away is an indication that 2000 years ago, at the peak of the Roman Empire, Scotland was still extensively covered in forest. Sadly, this is what much of the Highlands looks like today. Uh, and this is uh, the stump of a pine tree here in the foreground. You can see the roots of other ones in this exposed area of bare peat, what we call a peat hag. And you can see there's no living trees in sight anywhere. And this is the Highlands that is beloved of so many people, including uh, the Scottish Tourist Board that promotes these desolate landscapes as beautiful, undisturbed nature. The truth is, it's a ruined ecosystem. 
And I want to just take a step outwards for a moment from Scotland to present a slightly bigger picture, because that showed the picture, uh, the need for restoration in Scotland. But actually, this picture shows the same thing on a global scale. Many of you watching this perhaps have seen this particular photograph before, taken in 1968 by the Apollo 8 astronauts before people went to the moon. And out of thousands of pictures, this one is the one that's almost always used because the outline of the African continent is visible. I've had it on my wall for many years. And one day, probably 25 years ago now, I realized the most prominent thing in this photograph is deserts. The gray, the, the brown and red areas at the top of the photograph, North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, the Kalahari further south, the island of Madagascar just off center there. And although deserts are natural ecosystems, most of what's in this photograph is desertified landscapes. And we know, for example, that going back to Roman times 2000 years ago, the top of that photograph, North Africa, was heavily forested. And in that forest lived creatures like the Atlas bear and the Barbary lion, which are both now extinct. And of course, North Africa is now almost totally deforested. So this is a similar picture to that of Scotland. This is a depleted planet. This is an impoverished um, biosphere. And that's what we've inherited. And of course, our generation collectively is making it much worse. And that is the tide that has to turn now. So what's happened in Scotland, illustrated on the right hand photograph here, a standing dead Scots pine in a treeless landscape is now being carried out uh, large scale over large tracts of the planet. Photograph on the left I took in southern Venezuela many years ago, the northern edge of the Amazon basin, a charred stump of an old tree that was burned uh, as part of the process of creating cattle pasture. So this is happening as many of you know, I'm sure, all over the world today. So deforestation, loss of natural habitat is a global phenomenon. It has to be tackled everywhere. Many campaigns are focused on damage limitation, but we've got to move beyond that to regeneration or restoration. And of course, um, this was already mentioned in Jim's introduction, biodiversity loss. We're now causing the sixth mass extinction event on the planet. And uh, we're likely to lose, if things don't change, at least a million species that are at risk just now. These are five here which have disappeared, have gone extinct since the turn of this millennium. So in the last 21 years, starting in the early days of January 2000 with the Pyrenean ibex and most recently this Hawaiian snail that went extinct on the 1st of January 2019. This is the tip of the iceberg. Um, most species that vanish are probably invertebrates in a tropical rainforest that is cut down before it's been named or identified by scientists. 150 a day we're losing. So that's a shocking store, state of affairs but actually it's what's happened in Scotland over the last 2000 years or so. And these are some of the large species that we've lost uh, from Scotland, from the British Isles completely. Moose or elk, the Eurasian lynx, the brown bear, wild boar, and the most recent one to go, the wolf, uh, extinct by 1743. And the UK today, which Scotland is part of, is now recognised as one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. Uh, people have been living here a long time, we're densely populated, particularly in England, not so much in the Highlands of Scotland, but we've had this huge impact and we've reduced healthy landscapes to virtually nothing like this here. So the Highlands are a deforested, depleted landscape. Here's another on the right hand picture, one of these other pine stumps. Some of these have been dated to 4000 years old, preserved in peat bogs, but ones like this sticking up well above the vegetation, that tree was probably alive maybe 100 years ago. On the left, we've got a snag, a standing dead pine. That one was probably alive maybe 30 years ago and perhaps two centuries ago, there'd have been a forest there. So this process of forest loss has been going on for a long time, thousands of years, but it's really reached its terminal phase in the last hundred years or so. So if we look around the Highlands show evidence of what we've lost and the damage that's been done. On the left here, more uh, stumps of old pine trees in peat hags. Peat hags are areas where the peat has been exposed by the erosion of the surface vegetation because there's no longer healthy living tree roots to hold it in place. And these stumps often, they can be 4,000 years old because the peat is a natural preservative. So this is a tree cemetery, it's a forest graveyard. 
And on the right hand photograph, this is a very sad landscape for me. You can see the ruins of a croft in the background. People used to live here when the land could support them. Nowadays, there's no way anybody could eke out a living in this desolation. And those large blocks in the foreground are chunks of eroded peat that have been washed away because there's no trees to hold the soil in place anymore and they get deposited downstream like this. So this is the terminal phase of ecological decline in the highlands of Scotland. This, by contrast, is what the Caledonian forest is like in the few remnants where it survives. This is what all those landscapes you've just seen should look like. On the left, we've got Scots pines in green, birch trees yellow in autumn, so they stand out, a highland loch and mountains. And you can see the trees stretching as far as the eye can see. That's a very rare occasion, very rare occurrence in Scotland today. And on the right, the interior of the forest. Scots pines with lichens on their trunks, heather blooming there in purple uh, in late August, and the bright green is what we call blaeberry, uh, which is a, a blueberry. You'd probably call it blueberries in North America, but here we call them blaeberries. And you can see the, the diversity and the abundance of this landscape. And the Caledonian forest, as I mentioned before, is home to some iconic species. On the left, we've got the Capricale, the largest grouse in the world. Sadly, it was hunted to extinction in Scotland in the 1700s, but birds were reintroduced from Scandinavia in the early part of the following century, but it's now at risk again because its forest habitat has disappeared. And if things don't change, we could have the sad distinction of losing this species to extinction for the second time in Scotland. And on the right, twin flower, beautiful flower with two blossoms on the edge of this, um, the stem, occurs all over the boreal landscape from Canada through Scandinavia and very common everywhere, but except in Scotland, it's extremely rare here because its habitat has disappeared. So graphically, here's the state of affairs that we've inherited. This is a map of Scotland. And on the left, the shaded area shows the maximum extent of the Caledonian forest about 4,000 years ago. And you can see it covered most of the land. Around the coast, um, uh, particularly on the east, it was more of an oak dominated forest. And in the far north, it was a natural peat bog land. And if you're wondering why there's a big gap diagonally running across it, that's where Loch Ness is, what we call the Great Glen. It's mostly water, so trees never grew there. And on the right hand map, you can see these black areas are all that's left today. Tiny scattered remnants. Um, about 2% of the forest is all that we've got left. And that 2% is not in good condition. It's totally out of balance in the landscape. Um, we've got a tiny amount of old forests left and we've got far too many large herbivores. Deer numbers have been encouraged. Landowners who want to hunt them for sport, feed them in the winter. So animals that would naturally die of natural causes survive and they only shoot the males for trophy purposes. The females have no antlers. So the population of red deer, what you call elk in North America, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, has more than doubled here in the past 50 years. And they're naturally woodland animals. So they come into the forest, particularly in winter, for shelter and something to eat. And they eat any tree seedling, as you see in the middle photograph. And that's a pine seedling that's been heavily browsed. And I watched that for a number of years. And about a month after I took that photograph, all the needles were gone and it was dead. And the consequence of that you see in the right hand photograph, these old trees, they're venerable old beings. The oldest one in Scotland is 550 years old. They're at the end of their lives. They're dying naturally of old age, nothing wrong with that. But the problem is they're not being replaced by any new trees because deer and introduced sheep, which outnumber people in Scotland. We have 6 million sheep and about 5.4 million people. So sometimes I call us a nation of sheep. Um, they eat every seedling and that's caused this huge generation gap. So we've got these old trees and nothing growing to take their place. It's what I call a geriatric forest. It's like going to an old people's home, seeing these wonderful, wise, ancient trees at the end of their lives disappearing with no young ones to replace them. And it's not just the pines that get eaten. Deer have to be pretty desperate to eat Scots pine because they're spiky and prickly. And if you've ever tried chewing on a pine seed, a pine needle, it's a bit like having acupuncture done on your tongue. Um, they'd much rather eat trees like rowan, 
Sorbus cuparia, for those who know scientific names. It's the most palatable of all trees, along with aspen here. And this is a particular rowan I've been monitoring since October 1992. That's almost 30 years ago now. And it was already heavily browsed by deer when I found it in a treeless landscape. The seeds were germinated from bird droppings. And if you look at the following photographs, 96, 99, 2004, all the way up to 2015, the last visit I made there, you can see there's been no net growth of those um, young shoots. In fact, they've declined. They're smaller in size than they were in 1992. It only takes one deer in a landscape like that to find this rowan and eat it to death. And you can see there's no hope for trees to recover in that landscape because a single deer will find any young germinating seedling like that. And that's the end of it. Sheep also have an impact. Um, here on the left, you see a sheep inside a pine wood remnant. And if you think back to the photograph I showed a minute ago with the flowering heather and the blaeberries, well, there's heather there in that photograph, but it's cropped to about half an inch in size. And there's blaeberries there too, the green, but they're also cropped to half an inch in size. No chance to grow. So there's no understory there. There's no young trees. And on the right hand photograph, this is an area where sheep have been removed, but their impact still remains. Thousands of sheep walked the contours of that hillside for hundreds of years, trampling the soil and creating these compressed areas, the stratification that you see there. So the sheep are gone there, but there's still evidence of what they've done to the landscape. It doesn't have to be like this. In 2015, I organized a, a trip to uh, Southwest Norway for my colleagues at Trees for Life. And we went to see a site there where people left voluntarily in the early part of the last century, the 20th century. They were tempted by offers of free land in Wisconsin and Minnesota, places like that in the US. And that's the explanation why there's a football team called the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, they got their name from the, Nor the Norwegians who settled there. And when they left Norway, they weren't replaced by sheep or large numbers of deer the way it happened in Scotland. So the forest is recovered naturally in Norway. And what you see in the right hand photograph is a young birch woodland. Look at the landscape on the left, that's Scotland. Many people claim that trees would never grow here. It's too wet, it's too cold, it's too far north. But actually, if you look at the comparison, the picture in Norway is further north, it's wetter and it's colder and trees are flourishing. So we know they would grow here in Scotland too. Uh, it's not nature that's preventing it, it's humans. And in fact, we also have demonstrations of that here in Scotland as well. In many of the highland lochs, there are islands. And if you look closely at these islands, you often see that they're covered in trees. Here's two examples here from different parts of the highlands. And you can see totally treeless landscapes all around, overgrazed by deer and in some cases by sheep. But on the islands where there's no deer and no sheep, the forest is flourishing. It is so obvious what nature wants to do. And it's human actions, it's human pressures that are preventing that process from occurring. So I became aware of this in the early 1980s and I, I felt touched by these dying forest remnants and I kept thinking somebody needs to do something about this. Um, why isn't the Forestry Commission, the Government Forest Agency doing something? Why isn't the Nature Conservancy Council, the Conservation Agency, isn't that their job? And I kept feeling the trees calling out for help. So in 1986, I organized a big conference on the state of the environment. And in the final session, we asked all the 300 delegates, whoever wanted to, to make a commitment to do something positive for the planet. So my commitment in 1986 was to launch a project to restore this dying forest. At the time, I had no skill, no knowledge, no training. I had no access to land. I had no resources. On a physical level, I had nothing, but I had this deep connection with the land and with the forest. And I felt that if I followed my passion, I would find a way to make it work. So the rest of this presentation then is going to be about that work of regeneration, of restoration. So there's three key elements for that, which can be applied in any ecosystem that's degraded, um, but I'll look at them specifically in a Scottish context. So the first is you have to have restoration of healthy vegetation communities, because without vegetation, nothing else can live. The insects that feed on vegetation need the vegetation. The herbivores, the deer, the sheep, uh, all the other herbivores need vegetation to survive. And then the predators need the herbivores. So it starts with the vegetation communities. We've got to get those back to health. 
We need to reinstate key ecological processes which are not happening at the moment in Scotland. Natural succession, nutrient cycling, natural disturbance, predator-prey dynamics, none of those occur today in Scotland. And finally, we have to reintroduce missing species, ones that cannot uh, get back there by themselves, including large mammals and apex predators. And if we do these three things in conjunction, that will help healthy, self-sustaining ecosystems to recover naturally. And I want to emphasize this is a natural process which humans are assisting. It's not human management. It's allowing nature to do what nature wants to do herself. And there are a number of examples of this in Scotland now. These are two that I've not been directly involved with, but they've happened in the same time period that I've been working. On the left here, you can see lots of healthy young Scots pines in the foreground, seedlings that have grown naturally from the ones in the background, the mature ones. This is in the Cairngorms, the biggest mountain range and national park in Scotland. And this area was a playground for rich landowners for many years with very high numbers of deer. The current landowner decided to drastically reduce deer numbers uh, and all these trees have grown as a result of that by themselves, none of them planted. And on the right, the same thing with the birch wood. Again, deer numbers reduced drastically and trees spring back of their own accord. So that's possible in areas where people have got control of deer numbers. But in the areas I started working, it wasn't possible to reduce deer numbers for uh, reasons of neighboring landowners and wanting more deer. So fences had to be put up and working in partnership with the Forestry Commission. The initial project in 1990, 31 years ago, fenced off an area of 125 acres, 50 hectares on the edge of a woodland. And you can see that's me in my younger years with a full head of hair um, on the left there. The fence behind me, the mature trees behind that. And we picked that site because a research project that a student carried out for me found 100,000 pine seedlings already there. The progeny of those old ones in the background. Average age 10 years and average height about three and a half inches because 95% of them had been browsed by deer, as you saw earlier. So the fence went up and those 100,000 pine seedlings were able to grow. This is two years later in the left-hand photograph. They're already showing above the blaeberries there. And you can see healthy buds about to grow in that season in the summer of 1992. Move on 10 years to the middle photograph. That very same tree was about three times my height. And on the left, on the right-hand side, taken last September on the 20th anniversary, 30th anniversary of the fence going up, the tree is now about five times or six times my height. It's been producing cones and seeds of its own for about 15 years and supporting lots of life. All we've done is put a fence up to relieve the grazing pressure and nature has done everything else. This is even more dramatic. This is the same area. And this is not the middle of the fence, but this is the edge of the fence. Sorry, the, not the edge of the fence. This is the middle of the fence. And when the fence went up in 1990, those three dead pines in the center in the left-hand photograph, they were a really sad reflection of what was going on. That area was dying on its feet. Scots pines would die naturally of old age, uh, standing up. The wind takes off the needles and the twigs and the small branches very quickly, but the remaining trunk and big branches have a lot of resin in them. And that acts as a natural preservative. So these snags, as they're called, can persist for decades or even a century. So this was a very telling photograph of the dying forest when it was fenced in 1990. Look at the right-hand photograph. The same tree from the middle of the left-hand photograph is virtually unchanged in 30 years. The other two are there as well, but you can't see them because all those young pines have grown up and obscured them. Nobody planted those trees. Nature did the job herself. This is natural regeneration. This is the recovery of a landscape uh, of its own accord when the pressures that we put on it to prevent that are released and removed. So nature springs back by herself. And once the trees grow, of course, the insects return, the birds come to feed on them, and the whole web of life begins to recover and reweave itself. So that's how it started, finding areas on the edge of remnants and allowing them to regenerate. But in most of Scotland today, there are no remnants, as you saw from the map earlier. It's mostly treeless land. So we started planting trees the following year in 1991 
top left hand photograph was the first planting project we did. Uh, that's a volunteer there holding a pine seedling by his planting bag, about to plant it next to the stump of an old Scots pine. And that one's not one that was buried in peat for thousands of years. It was probably a living tree 50 years ago, cut down to make um, a lodge for people to hunt deer. And it's a good place for pines to grow. So when we plant trees, we seek to mimic how nature would do the job. So we're not planting in straight lines, we're planting in irregular clumps and clusters, and we're looking for the right soil conditions for the trees to grow. And you can see in the photograph in the bottom left, uh, the result 11 years later. And not only has the pine grown, you can see it there to the left of the stump, but look at the stump itself. In the top photograph, all the roots were exposed because the heather and other vegetation was suppressed, just like uh, everything else is suppressed by the deer. The area was fenced when the trees were planted and the stump in the bottom picture there, you can see the roots have now been covered over by heather that's been free to grow. It was there before, but it was suppressed and there's blaberries growing on top of the stump. Look at the right hand photograph. That's the same scene in 2016, 25 years after the tree was planted. It's now much taller than me there. And the stump is almost invisible. It's still there. You can just see a little bit of the gray bark, but the heather and other vegetation has grown and covered it completely. This is the earth, the landscape healing. And this is even more dramatic. This is the same area. Those are some of the pines that were planted in the top right of the photograph, the fence. And look at the difference between the inside and the outside here. Outside the fence on the left, we've just got grass. Grass has adapted to high grazing pressure. That's why you have to mow your lawn in summer because your lawnmower mimics the grazing of herbivores and grass shoots again from the base and it keeps growing. So in heavy grazing, that's all you get is grass. And you can see a peat hag there, one of those naked wounds, those exposed areas in the, in the vegetation. Inside the fence though, in addition to the pines growing, we've got heather flowering again. And the plant in the bottom left is bog myrtle, which is an aromatic shrub, highly palatable to deer as well. But crucially, its name gives it away. It grows in bog, so it grows in wet ground and it has bacterial nodules growing on its roots, which fix nitrogen. So it improves the soil and is part of the succession process, preparing the way for uh, other things like trees that will follow once the soil has been enriched and it's been dried out. So this is the nature's garden on the right hand side inside the fence and the desolate wasteland outside that we've inherited from the past. It is so simple, it is so obvious. Here's another couple of pictures showing the same thing. On the left, we've got the fence again, the same fence, but this is the other side of that exclosure. We call them exclosures because they're designed to exclude deer. And again, you see the flowering heather, lots of young birches, the bright green, growing self-sown from the big birches, the darker green uh, in the background. And in the top left, you can just see a few pines that were planted where there were no birches growing. Looking along the fence line again, you see the contrast inside on the left, rich, virtu uh, rich beautiful um, wild garden. And on the outside, just grass, and you can see a couple of stumps poking up through it. The right hand photograph, even more dramatic, taken about uh, seven or eight miles further up this glen, as we call valleys in Scotland. No trees left there at all, but we found an eared willow seedling growing by the banks of the Afric River. We put a stock fence around it, and seven years later, the eared willow there, you can see it's grown up with multiple stems, but bluebells were flowering there. And that was truly miraculous because bluebells uh, are an indicator of oak woodland and the nearest bluebells to this scene here, I estimate are about 20 miles away. How did the seeds get there? We've no idea. It's a miracle. It's how nature responds when we give nature our care, our attention, our love. Um, the landscape, its inherent desire is to heal itself, to create maximum biodiversity and abundant life. And this little fence keeping the deer out enabled that to happen. So this is uh, ecological succession in action. Um, as I said earlier, we've got these museum type landscapes in Scotland. We go to see museums uh, to see dead relics of the past. And that's what we've got with the pine stumps in the peat hags and this landscape that's frozen in time as grassland, minimum biological productivity. 
So the left hand photograph, the fence there keeping deer out, you see the brown is heather beginning to grow as we've seen in a couple of images before. And outside the fence, the heather is there, but it's still suppressed. So that's the first stage, you get grassland replaced by heathland. And then as the heather grows, you get the pioneer trees, the birch, the willow, the rowans, and in some cases aspen growing in the heather. And you can see that in the right hand photograph. And those are pioneer trees, they're short lived, fast growing, and they enrich the soil and prepare the way for the slower growing species that follow, like pine and in areas of better soil, things like oak. So we've got succession beginning to happen now. That's a stage of the recovery, a return to health of the landscape. And when the trees grow, you get these ecological relationships becoming re-established. Ecologists and many people now know that every forest in the world and many other ecosystem types um, is not just trees in the case of forest, but an integral part of it are the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi that grow in partnership with the trees and then exchange nutrients with them. And that is what gives forests their resilience and their strength to withstand variations in climate and rainfall and so forth. So here, one of the trees we planted in the exclosures I just showed you, um, this is a, a fungus um, in the Russula genus, which is a mycorrhizal with Scots pine. It's a classic species that you find with Scots pine. We didn't introduce the fungus. When the trees were growing, the fungal spores arrived and it's growing by itself. And on the right, this is um, an aspen leaf, uh, a tree that we protected with a fence so it could grow. And these are sawfly larvae feeding on the leaf. And of course, they're food for birds. And the birds come and often they will bring seeds uh, in their gut, which get deposited in their droppings and then plants grow like we saw with the, blade, the bluebells earlier. So the whole process of recovery starts to get underway. And these are four pictures of many I've got of creatures living on trees that have grown either where they've regenerated naturally or where uh, in some cases they've been planted by us. And these just return by themselves spontaneously. Um, green hair streak butterfly in the bottom left there. Top right is the cresty tip, one of our characteristic species of the pine woods. And it's sitting there in that tree that you saw the three photographs of me dating from 92 to 2020. So that was really wonderful there on the 20th anniversary of the fence to see this bird in the tree. It was like, yes, nature's responded. And over time, even the peat hags, those most desolate areas of bleakness that scar so many glens in the highlands, they begin to heal. Um, photograph on the left is one that's got no protection. The one on the right, there's a fence there you can see in the top right of the photograph. And look at what's happened. There's still a stump there in the middle of the picture, but heather has grown over it and it's in flower. And the red in the met bottom center of the photograph is sphagnum moss. That's what colonizes the bare wet ground. And over time, those develop and revegetate that bare peat and they improve the soil as we've seen with the bog myrtle and so forth. So over time, this will heal and become a more healthy, diverse landscape. It's a slow process though. In this case, uh, it's taken about 25 years to get to that stage. So with the vegetation recovery underway, then we can think about some of the other things. We've talked about the restoration of ecological processes like succession. We can then think about reintroducing some of the missing species. And we've now got two of our formerly extinct species back in Scotland. The European beaver was reintroduced in a trial program run by the Scottish government starting in uh, 2009 uh, in the Argyll Peninsula. And um, there's now two populations in Scotland and they're growing, they're bringing a lot of ecological benefits. The beavers are keystone species that create small patches of wetland habitat through their dams, which benefit many other uh, wildlife, particularly aquatic invertebrates and the birds that feed on them and even the young fish that feed on them. And of course, they help to regulate the extremes of heavy rainfall and drought, uh, avoiding problems of flooding downstream. And then we've also got wild boar back. Um, they uh, were in some farms in Scotland and some escaped or maybe were even deliberately released. So they're now present in some of the Highland Glens too. And they're very important because uh, they're large animals. They move around. They have quite a natural disturbance effect. I'll show you that in a minute or two. So it's great that we've got some things back. And when we get them back, we begin to get more of these ecological relationships and processes re-established. 
On the left here, this is an aspen growing as a root sucker of a parent tree. Aspen hardly ever flowers in Scotland, so it rarely produces seeds, but mature trees send up young shoots called suckers off their root system, and they're highly palatable for deer, so they just get eaten like everything else does. This is one we protected, and it grew about four feet in 10 weeks because it wasn't having to feed itself from a tiny seed. It had the whole resources of a parent tree in its big root system. So the young shoot grew quite quickly. And here you see aphids sucking the sap of the aspen and wood ants tending the aphids. The wood ants are actually are another keystone species. They farm the aphids and eat the honeydew with the aphids secrete as a waste product. And they even move them around to choice feeding sites on young trees. So very important to get these sorts of relationships um, back in place again because the ants have a significant effect on the understory of the forest ecosystem. And on the right, very interesting, my charity uh, Trees for Life um, got some boar in an exclosure as an experiment to see if they would control bracken which was spreading uh, uncontrolled in the absence of anything to limit it. And uh, we got them just before heavy snowfall in one winter. And within 24 hours of the boar being there, Robins, the little bird you see here, started following the boar around. And this is a well-known relationship in continental Europe where boar have never been hunted to extinction like they were in Scotland. Boar coexist with the robins and the robins are opportunistic feeders on the exposed soil looking for grubs and worms that the boar miss. In Scotland today, the robins have had to adapt to the absence of boar in the past uh, with surrogates. We call them gardeners. I'm a vegetable gardener and when I dig my ground every year to sow my vegetables in spring, the robins appear because I'm doing what the boar should do naturally. So uh, within 24 hours, we had the robins back with the boar. They have long ecological memories and those linkages re-established very quickly. Some species need help though. Um, one of them here on the left, our native squirrel, the red squirrel, has suffered greatly in Britain. It's vanished from most of England and the Caledonian forest is its stronghold in Scotland. But if you remember the map showing the Scotland, uh, the Caledonian forest today, the remnants are highly dispersed and isolated from each other. And many of them don't have squirrels anymore. And squirrels won't uh, travel more than uh, 100 yards or so over treeless ground because they're vulnerable to predation. So they cannot naturally recolonize these isolated woodland remnants where they disappeared. So we started a project to capture them where they're abundant and release them into these isolated forest remnants because squirrels have an ecological functionality. They collect seeds in the late summer and autumn, which they cache, they store for the winter and they never find them all. And those seeds that they don't find germinate and are a new generation of trees. So we sometimes call squirrels nature's tree planters. And if they're missing from an ecosystem, that compounds this uh, inability of the forest to regenerate itself. So bringing them back is an important step. Other species, the Eurasian lynx here on the right, um, they cannot recolonize Britain because they're totally extinct on our island and they cannot swim the channel from France. So they have to be brought back. So there's a big pressure now from conservationists to reintroduce predators because we have no large predators left. They're all gone. And we know from the experience of places like Yellowstone, when you bring back an uh, apex predator like the wolf, it has this cascade of benefits for many other species. The wolf is very controversial. Uh, we're all raised with uh, children's fairy tales about the big bad wolf. And, and when we're a bit older, we often go to see Hollywood werewolf movies. So the wolf is the most demonized creature on the planet, totally unjustified, um, but it's a huge PR problem in a country like Scotland. So the lynx is the species that we're targeting first. We'd like to see the lynx brought back. It doesn't have uh, a lot of propaganda directed against it. It's a solitary animal, hardly ever seen, poses no threat to people and would have an important role in helping to modify and regulate deer populations and their behavior. So um, getting towards the end here, uh, I just want to summarize uh, the principles of ecological restoration that have been developed over the course of more than three decades of work that I've been engaged with. Some of these I've talked about before, and these principles can be applied to any ecosystem. So thinking back again about regeneration, if you want to regenerate your ecosystem, these principles can be applied anywhere. Um, they're general. 
And so there's a lot of common sense too. So number one, you work from areas of strength. Start where the ecosystem is closest to its natural condition. So in our case, we started with helping the existing remnants to regenerate. Nature sows the seeds herself, as you see in the left in the photograph here. We didn't need to plant anything there. Uh, so that's the easiest way. Start from areas of strength. Pay attention to keystone species, the Scots pine, the beaver, the wood ants, I've talked about those. Utilize ecological processes, begin with pioneer species, use natural succession to facilitate the rewilding process. Mimic nature wherever possible. So when we're planting trees, we avoid straight lines. We plant in clusters and clumps, leave gaps. Think like a tree. If I was a tree, if I was this tree, what soil would I like to grow in? And that's the place to plant it. Recreate ecological niches where they've been lost. One of those, uh, for example, is dead wood. There's virtually no dead wood in Scottish woodlands today. It's all been extracted. And dead wood is vital for recycling nutrients and is the habitat for a whole host of communities of organisms called detritivores. Everything from beetle larvae um, to various plants, uh, microorganisms and fungi all thrive on dead wood. That needs to be there. So uh, we make sure there's dead wood in the forest that we're re-establishing. Re-establish ecological linkages, connect the threads in the web of life. This photograph here is an example of a different ant species, a red ant, tending a different species of aphids on eared willow. And that was growing in a tiny deer uh, stock fenced exposure beside the Afric River. Uh, the eared willow was there already, we just protected it, and these creatures appeared of their own accord because the habitat was there for them. Control and or remove invasive, introduce non-native species. We've got issues with grey squirrels in Scotland, which outcompete our red squirrels, and Sitka spruce from the west coast of Canada. The temperate rainforest species is now the most numerous tree in Scotland because it's the backbone of our commercial timber industry and it's spread. So we spend a lot of our time removing that from our precious tiny remnants of native forest. Remove or mitigate the limiting factors that prevent rewilding from occurring naturally. So in our case, that is the huge imbalance with far too many herbivores, way beyond the carrying capacity of the vegetation to support them. So fence them out, reduce their numbers. And now there is a big movement to reduce sheer uh, sheep numbers in the Highlands of Scotland. And we've got to tackle the deer issue, but that's a huge problem because <coughs> a lot of economic interests want more deer uh, for trophy purposes. Pay special attention to species with limited ability to disperse. I mentioned red squirrel already. Aspen, which hardly ever seeds when it's removed from an area, will not get back, so we plant aspen. Wood ants, like squirrels, um, they disperse when winged queens mate with males in the summer. They have a flight distance of about 100 metres. So if you've got an isolated woodland remnant with no ants, wood ants are not going to get back there by themselves. So there's no experimental work being done to translocate wood ants. Twin flower again, abundant everywhere else in its range, very scarce in Scotland. Um, it spreads uh, vegetatively and um, again has been vulnerable to trampling, erosion, and uh, overgrazing. Reintroduce species that are unlikely or impossible to return by themselves, particularly the top predators. Re establish other ecological processes, predator prey dynamics, non existent in Scotland today. Nutrient cycling. That is still not happening in most of our highland landscapes. The deer that are shot for sport, their carcasses are exported uh, to a butcher somewhere else. Uh, the same thing with sheep. And while one deer, one sheep may not make a lot of difference, when you think of hundreds of thousands of them over two centuries, that's a huge net loss of nutrients from our already depleted landscapes. And nothing is ever put back. Natural disturbance, occasional fire, wind throw, flood. You know, at the moment our remnants are too small, we've got to prevent those, but ideally we should be having those um, back in place too, because they create variability, heterogeneity in the landscape. Number 12, very important, let nature do most of the work. This is not about managing land. This is about stepping back and letting nature do her thing. And that's crucial because at the moment, the thrust of our mainstream culture is to manage every square inch of the planet. And that is what's driving species to extinction and breaking the functionality of ecosystems everywhere. 
So it's actually letting nature do most of the work, learning a little bit of human humility. Human interventions should be the minimum necessary and designed to be as inconspicuous as soon as possible. So fences, to me, uh, are an emergency, temporary measure to help the vegetation recover. It's a bit like if I break my leg, I need crutches until my leg heals and is strong enough to take my weight again. So the land needs a bit of help with fences as a short term measure in ecological terms to enable uh, the vegetation to recover and then the fences get dismantled and removed. And number 14, uh, this is um, perhaps the most important one for me in many ways, what uh, many people know as the green thumb principle. And that is something that was fundamental to the Findhorn community where I live. The experience, the personal experience that love has a tangible positive effect on all living things to which it is directed. Many people know this, you know, somebody you might know an elderly aunt or a neighbor who's got a green thumb Actually, it's the wrong terminology because it should really be the green heart because it's the heart that makes the difference. The thumb only does the work of the heart. It's the love that that elderly aunt gives to her roses means they never get bugs on them or that they flower longer than everybody else's. And it's the same thing uh, with pets. Pets that are raised in an atmosphere of love, you know, they flourish and are happy. And any parent knows that children benefit from love too. So that also has a tangible effect on plants, on landscapes, on wildlife populations. Nature responds to human love that is focused and directed. So finally then, I just want to build on that a little bit and say that ecological restoration is the work which reconnects the strands in the web of life. But crucially, it is also the work which reconnects humans with the rest of life, because we have become disconnected, separate, disengaged. Most of us live in cities. We don't know where our food comes from, where our waste goes, or even what some of our local indigenous species are in many cases. We live surrounded by concrete and steel and glass. We're tuned into the internet, but we're not tuned into our local web of life. So when we take part in restoration, it's not just healing a landscape, it's healing that broken relationship between ourselves and the rest of nature. Many of you may know this quote from Chief Seattle. This we know, all things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. So when we break the web, we break our own connections to nature. But the converse is also true. When we actually help the web to reweave itself, we reweave the web uh, in ourselves too and connect ourselves with nature again. And as the land heals, so too do we experience personal healing. So it's the work that reconnects us, in my experience of over 30 years of doing this, with some of the most important qualities in any individual's life. It connects us with the rest of nature, as I just said. It connects us with place. I have to know intimately the landscape if I want to help it recover and restore. It connects me with life. Very important in a world today where our mainstream culture is totally fixated on death and destruction, violence. Look at what dominates the news. It connects us with each other because we find a shared passion, a shared care, a shared concern for nature and the earth. These two young women here uh, came to work on my project in Scotland from Madagascar. They were working in a tree nursery there because Madagascar is one of the most deforested countries on the planet, critical for its rare and special biodiversity. And they wanted to gain the benefit of experience working with others. So they came and volunteered with us. So we connect with each other. Crucially, it connects people with their own power. How many people in the world today feel impotent at the wave of destruction that's unfolding everywhere? I found my power by helping this landscape to recover, helping these trees to grow again. Some of them might live to be 500 years old, supporting a whole cascade of life and touching generations of people well into the future. That's my power to make a difference. Connects us with healing, I've spoken about that already. It's also connects us with hope, a quality that's desperately needed on the planet today. 
And I don't know if those trees I've planted or helped to regenerate naturally will be there in 100 years time or 200 years time. I won't be around to see them, but it's a statement of hope that I care about the future. I care about the welfare and well-being of future generations of people, of birds, of fungi, of insects, of mammals, of all life. And crucially, it connects me with spirit. The spirit in myself, the spirit in each other's hearts, and the spirit of nature herself, the spirit of Gaia, the living planet of which we're part. So it provides an opportunity for each of us to make a positive difference in the world, to do something that is a work of our hearts, a labor of love. It's not something to do to earn a living from. This landscape cannot support people, maybe for decades or even centuries, because there's nothing there at the moment. We have to give something back because so much has been taken. It has to be a labor of love, a work of joy, a gift to the future. And when we do that, we can accelerate that process of healing. When we focus on it, when we meditate with the land, as you see those people doing there around that old pine snag, um, tuning into the life that used to be there and imagining the life that will come from the work that we do. We can accelerate that process. And the need for ecological restoration that I began at the beginning is now global. There's that picture of uh, the land uh, showing the desertified areas on the left, the hands nurturing the tree in the middle, and the future of the planet and all its species is in all of our hands now there on the right. And for many years, I have this vision that the work I've been doing in Scotland of restoring a forest needs to become a global priority for countries and nations all over the planet. I had this vision in the late 1990s that the 21st century would one day be declared the century of restoring the earth. You know, we have things like International Year of Peace and there was a decade of indigenous people um, a few years ago. And we need to think in ecological terms. We've never had a century before, but a century of restoring the earth. And I worked on a project like that for a number of years, trying to get the UN to make the declaration. Well, it wasn't successful at the time, but if you've been paying attention, you will know that something happened last month. The UN said the world must rewild on a massive scale to heal nature and climate. And that was part of the launch of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Wonderful. The body that represents all the nations and peoples of the planet is now saying we need 10 years to restore things. So actually 10 years is not enough, but it's a great start. And I still hold the vision that we'll have a century of restoring the earth. So that brings me to my final picture. Uh, you saw this earlier. This is the recovery of a natural forest. Uh, trees that we've planted, heather that's growing because it's protected from deer. Look at the trees, they're not in straight lines, they're separated by big spaces, they have freedom to be themselves. And this is the hope for the future. This is the better world that we're passing on to future generations in the Highlands of Scotland. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for paying attention. And um, I think um, Jim will take over from here perhaps with um, some comments. I'll stop sharing my screen and see you there again. Hi, Jim. So I overran by a couple of minutes, but hopefully not too much. <laughs> Alan, you are a regeneration first responder par excellence. <laughs> <laughs> it's so synchronistic that we're having our open house mm -hmm. on regeneration first responders. And when you and I today, and when you and I set the date for you speaking today, we had no idea that the open house was going to take place. So the synchronicity uh, of this presentation on this day is uh, quite extraordinary and, and very, uh, very affirming. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I think the note that you struck right at the end uh, from the United Nations designating this decade uh, as the decade for the restoration, the rewilding of nature, the restoration of nature uh, is, is so timely and so important. Uh, Humanity Rising is dedicating itself uh, to uh, this decade. Uh, we're gonna run all the way through 2030, day in and day out, uh, supporting people like you, profiling, uh, people like you. So people now all over the world uh, uh, will uh, be hearing about the Caledonian Force. Uh, many people for the first time 
and we uh, we do so so that people uh, like yourself, the as, as a regeneration first responder, uh, for some thirty years now, uh, can uh, receive the recognition and the support that you need. So thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, everything uh, that you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, very timely. And to me, that's what happens. Um, that sort of synchronicity that you mention happens when I follow my heart and I see it happening in other people's lives when they follow their heart, when they follow their calling, find their life purpose. Synchronicities are a regular occurrence because that's what the universe, the world is calling from all of us. And um, it's a wonderful experience to have. And um, it's, it's, yeah, I smile because it's not the first time by any means these sorts of things have happened to me. <laughs> well, it's just a few questions, just so I can uh, be clear in my own mind, because, you know, when I saw the slide of the massiveness of the Caledonian forest 4,000 years ago and now shrunk to almost imperceptible little dots on the Scottish landscape. The, the question that arose in my mind that I wasn't clear about from your presentation is, um, did you have permission to go there? I mean, are these, are the remaining little uh, enclaves of the forest, are they national government um, uh, protected areas? Are they privately held? Because you seem in the course of your presentation, you were working uh, the land as it were in an ongoing way, did you have to get permission to do it? Did you just do it uh, unilaterally? What was the structure through which you worked? Well, initially, thanks for the question. Initially, it was all with um, landowners. Um, the Highlands of Scotland has uh, never had land reform. So we've got one of the most antiquated archaic land ownership systems on the planet. Uh, the land is owned in big parcels, mainly by absentee landowners. Uh, who used to live in Glasgow or Edinburgh, the big cities in Scotland, or maybe London. Nowadays, they live in the United Arab Emirates, Malaysia, Denmark. <laughs> and many of these people, Amazing. you know, they, they're very wealthy. They come here for a few weeks of the year to shoot some deer. And that's the issue. That's the problem. You know, their interest is in deer. They don't see the state of the land. There are exceptions, but mostly that's what they are. So I had to find willing landowners to work with. And initially, a lot of the work was done with the Forestry Commission, which is our equivalent in Britain of the Forest Service in the US. And they own some of the best remnants. But at the time, this was in the late 80s, early 90s, um, they had experienced budget cuts because of government policy changes, and they didn't have money to do much work. They'd done a little bit of experimental work in the 60s. And that was part of my inspiration. I saw areas that had been fenced then and the whole forest recovery process was happening. And I was thinking, why are they not doing more? And, you know, it was a lot to do with, you know, uh, lack of resources on their part. So I was able to raise money privately and forge a partnership. So we worked with um, the Forestry Commission with a big organization called the National Trust for Scotland, which is a sort of organization, a charity that was set up to protect Scottish heritage buildings and all sorts of things, but also land, worked with them. And then in 2008, the charity I set up, Trees for Life, raised enough money to buy land itself, 10,000 acres, 4,000 hectares. And that was a turning point because up till then, it was always a question of negotiating with landowners and finding common ground with them, which was, you know, able to do people, yes, lots of trees, but government agencies weren't willing to think about reintroduction of wolves or wild boar or anything like that. So it was always a question of compromising, you know, what mm. we could do. We could do some parts of the restoration work, but not others. So buying our own land enabled us to have wild boar there, as I showed, for instance. And we had full control for the first time of deer numbers because deer management in Scotland is exclusively in the hands of landowners. And until we became a landowner ourselves, we had no influence or say over deer management. Of course, that's the crucial issue. So the charity Trees for Life now owns 10,000 acres of land, but it still works in partnership with the Forestry Commission, although it's got a new name now, it's Forestry and Land Scotland, and various other private landowners. 
And the great thing we've got in Scotland is that we've got uh, freedom to walk anywhere. Um, that's uh, enshrined in Scottish law of open access across the land. So I know in other countries like in the US, you know, you can put up a private sign, keep out and you're not allowed in there. Um, that only applies in Scotland to very specific areas like people's personal gardens and anything like that. But to these wide open landscapes, it's open access for anybody. So I was able to go to these places, look at them, see what was going on, find seedlings that were getting eaten and make project proposals to protect them. Amazing. Amazing. So you've, you've got 10,000 acres. And did you buy it from a, a, a landowner that that just had a, a big stand of forest? How did that happen? Well, the land was, it was owned uh, typically by an, an absentee landlord. He was an elderly Italian man. And he uh, seemed to travel the world shooting things because uh, the building on it, which was a big bungalow, had photographs of him with dead animals all over the world. You know, a big bear somewhere, um, on the ground with his head on its head and a rifle in his hand and rare antelopes and things like that. That was all he seemed to do. He only came here for a few weeks of the year. He died actually uh, without leaving a will and we were able to negotiate um, a private purchase without having to compete on the open market because previously I tried to buy three other areas of land but they were all in the open market and I was outbid. So in this case, we were able to negotiate a private deal and we got funding from several major benefactors, private individuals, and a big grant from a charitable trust that enabled us to, to buy 10,000 acres of land. And other conservation charities have bought similar areas. You know, there's a number of them in Scotland who have bought up some of the forest remnants. We have the biggest one is called the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, RSPB. And they bought one of the best forest remnants in 1988 in the Cairngorms, now in the Cairngorms National Park. So a few of them are in conservation hands, but many of these remnants are still privately owned and there's still nothing being done uh, to help them recover. They're still in decline and that's really sad. Yes, yes. Well, your work, Alan, reminds me a lot of what Linda Tucker has done with the White Lion Protection Trust down in South Africa, where mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it was the white lions that had been hunted to virtual extinction. Uh, she was uh, seized by this uh, through an amazing story, actually, but uh, then went out and with benefactors in support bought land uh, mm -hmm. and began to resuscitate and rewild uh, the white lions that had been reduced uh, to essentially canned hunting and be, were being grown in cages. And then these guys like this Italian guy would go down and, and shoot them. Um, they were never really in the wild, so they didn't have a way even anywhere to go to hide. So they were complete like sitting ducks. Uh, and Linda's been laboring away there in, in South Africa, and we've been uh, supporting her for many, many years. And now South Africa, uh, uh, over the last several months, has agreed uh, to stop the canned hunting of lions. Uh, and Linda's uh, pride, the lion pride now, flourishes uh, in the uh, uh, Timbavati uh, preserve there which isn't far from the Kruger uh, mm -hmm. pre Preserve, if you know where that is in, in South yeah. Africa. Uh, so like you, uh, Linda is, is staked out a piece of land and, and established an, a, uh, an enclave there. Uh, and it's become a real light community, uh, like I imagine uh, Trees for Life has established there in, in Scotland. So. Uh, really marvelous, really, really marvelous. Um, yeah, I think there's there's many examples of people doing this sort of thing all over the world. Yeah. I travel, uh, not recently because of COVID, but I travel and visit restoration projects. And it's, it's usually individuals who have a deep connection with their local area, yeah. wherever that is, and feeling they need to do something and not waiting for governments or big organizations. It's just a, an individual following the passion of their heart. And that I think is one of the really important things I want to say because everybody has something they feel passionate about in their heart. And what we need to do is create a, a culture that supports and encourages people to follow that passion. 
because that is the gift that each of us has to give to the world to manifest our passion, our care, our love, uh, particularly for things in nature. And when more people do that, it inspires other people, just as you've been inspired by Linda there. Many others have been inspired by her. And I see that with everybody who's taking these steps to protect their local forest or rare species or crucial habitat. You know, it's attractive and magnetic. It's this work of hope. And that really, you know, touches people. Yes. Well, someone in the chat, uh, Diane uh, Skidmore, I think, was mentioning that there's this uh, network of, of guerrilla gardeners, of mm -hmm. people that uh, just go out in the dead of night <laughs> and plant things and uh, let all little animals out and you know do all kinds of things just uh, at mm -hmm. the level of guerrilla activity. Uh, so there's a lot uh, going out there. Uh, so Alan, as we uh, draw this uh, session to a close, um, just uh, speak to us uh, for a minute or two on you know, you've, you've been at it for 30 years, you know, and I'd love to hear, you know, a distillation of, um, of sort of a wisdom that you've gleaned uh, just personally uh, after uh, curating and now establishing uh, a 10,000 acre rewilding uh, and regeneration of the Caledonian forest what wisdom would you share with us that has, has been um, developed in your psyche and soul in the course of these decades? Well, thanks. That's a good question. I, I think just off the top of my head, there's two different answers to that. The first is that um, for the first time in planetary history, I think natural ecosystems, the biosphere, needs help. Yes, you could argue that 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and exterminated the dinosaurs and 75% of all other life and biodiversity got a huge setback, but it recovered. It took 5 million years and we now have more species on the planet than before that asteroid hit. So we humans are now having the same effect, you know. We're not an asteroid, but we're climate change, we're deforestation, pollution, plastic, all the problems, you know, all impacting nature. And we don't know how long it will take for the Earth to recover. That's where we need to help. And it needs each one of us to find our piece of that puzzle to do that. And nature has this tremendous self-healing ability. Many years ago, I went to a um, place uh, a bit further north than where you are in California, uh, Mount St. Helens in the southern part of Washington state. It erupted in 1980, as I'm sure you remember, and it devastated a huge area of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. Trees were blown down like matchsticks and the whole area was covered by many feet of ash. When I went 13 years later in 1993, young trees were growing and I watched chipmunks scurrying across the ash with their cheeks bulging, carrying seeds. You know, nature's dispersal agents like our red squirrels. The whole process was uh, underway there. And this has become this huge experiment. I've not been back since. I was there uh, several years ago and it was uh, a very cold May and the roads were closed. I couldn't get into the site, but it's ongoing. It's a study project looking at how does nature recover? Mm. When we give her the space, that's what happens. 10,000 years ago in Scotland, we had no trees because the whole country had been covered by ice in the last ice age. And when the temperature warmed up, the ice melted. Nobody planted trees, they came back by themselves. The difference now is because our impacts are so severe, so extreme, so diverse and so deadly that we actually have to assist that recovery process. So that's the first thing. Nature needs our help needs the help of everybody who cares, everybody who feels a love and a connection with nature has something to give. Even if it's just growing a single plant in your garden, you know, that plant will support insects, uh, it will attract birds, and it will attract smiles from passerby when it flowers, you know, to something on a much bigger scale. And then the second answer to the question is that we each have the power to make a huge difference in the world. Mm. Many people today, you know, they get overwhelmed at the scale of, you know, the destruction of the Amazon, rising temperatures, the extinction crisis, it's all too much. 
and they become paralyzed. And what I found, and this is the crucial message, what I found is that I have access to unlimited power. And it's not the old form of power, the power over which is what dominates in our world today. It's the power of the rich over the poor. It's the power of the whites over the coloreds. It's the power of men over women. It's the power of humans over nature. That is the old form of power whose days are numbered. I'm talking about the different form of power, which is the power from within. Mm. And that power is the power to be myself, to live my highest calling, my inspiration, my passion my spirit, if you like, my life purpose. And that power is unlimited. And that power does not diminish anybody else. It does not suppress anybody else. It has the opposite effect. It inspires other people. I don't know how you heard about me, but I got invited to give a talk here. You know, that's what happens. I get lots of these invitations um, and I get feedback that I inspire people. That's my power. That's the power of my passion. That's the power of my heart. And I've manifested that by translating it into practical action. And Trees for Life, the charity I founded, has now planted about 2 million trees. It's not just the 10,000 acres the charity owns. It's all the tens of thousands of acres that it's worked on on other people's land. And it's the projects that have started as a result of that inspiration. I could name several you know, in different parts of the world that started as a result of being inspired. That power ultimately inside me is the same power that's inside you and inside everybody. It's unlimited because it's the power of the oneness of all life. It's the power, the life force of the universe that seeks to manifest and express through everything from bacteria and microorganisms, you know, to plants, to animals, to humans. And we have the ability to manifest it very specifically and very consciously in a way that is you know, on a larger scale and more profound than many other organisms. Mm. And our task as human beings is now to take that power and align it because people have used that power. Entrepreneurs use that power, you know, uh, sending a man to the moon as Kennedy did. That was using that power of passion and inspiration. But we now have to use that in alignment with the well-being of our living planet, all her species, all humanity, not for selfish or narrow reasons anymore. And we each have a way to do that. And the key to it is finding the thing that each person feels most passionate about. I sometimes say to people, if there were no obstacles or problems or limits in the world, if you didn't have to do a job you didn't like to earn money, what would you do with your time? What do you do in your spare time? You know, that you just do it for the sheer love of it. That's what you should be doing. That's what you should be making the focus of your life. That's what the world needs of you, needs of each one of us. That's what I've been learning. And I'm just a little guy. I'm five foot four. You know? <laughs> People think of me sometimes as a gnome, you know, but I've got huge power. We all have huge power if we open our hearts and let it come alive in our lives, in our actions, in our words. And that is the critical issue of our time, because when enough of us do that, we reach a critical mass. That is what's going to change the world. That is that is true humanity rising. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Alan, thank you so much. You are uh, an inspiration to us all. Uh, and um, power is not uh, measured in size or stature. Uh, power is uh, measured in a capacity to courageously manifest love. And you embodied that for us exactly. today. And I just want to acknowledge you and thank you. Uh, and if uh, anyone out there wants to become a, a regeneration first responder like Alan, I just put the link again to our open house uh, uh, which is an invitation to all of you to, uh, to join Alan and thousands and millions of people actually around the world uh, that are working 24-7, 365 with all their heart, strength, and soul uh, to regenerate the planetary uh, ecology. Uh, so thank you, uh, Alan. 
Uh, and then tomorrow, everyone, we're going to listen to uh, one of the master storytellers of our time, an elder uh, named Michael Mead, uh, who's been telling stories um, for many, many years. Uh, and he's going to tell us uh, a, a ancient story from the indigenous mind uh, that exemplifies like Alan has done today with the Caledonian forest, um, the challenges that we face, and yet, nevertheless, what we must now do. So that'll be tomorrow on Humanity Rising. Again, Alan uh, Featherstone, uh, thank you so much for your inspiration today. Uh, and we'll see you all same time, same station tomorrow on Humanity Rising. Bye for now. Thanks for the opportunity to make this presentation and bye from me as well. <laughs> Thank you, Alan.